Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I hope you all had a wonderful Labor Day weekend and didn't eat anything that I wouldn't have approved of. Um, today I have a couple things I want to talk about, but first just a few announcements. Winters, or, uh, yeah, fall semester for the Institute starts next Monday. Time to get enrolled if you're planning to take classes with us. And don't forget about our fall conference, November 8th through 10th. Dr. Colin Campbell will be here to talk about whole. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer from True North, Dr. Joe Keon, the author of Whitewash. Lots of fabulous guests. You don't want to miss it. And then a couple things coming up for Wellness Forum on um, September 5th, that's Thursday, Intro to Plant-Based Nutrition, and uh, Tuesday, September 10th, next week, uh, Dell Conversations with Chef Dell, he's gonna do Tofu 101. Interesting, easy stuff to do with tofu that your family will love. All right, things I wanna to cover today, I wanna to start with sleep deprivation. Um, most American adults, well actually I would say most kids too, live in a chronic state of sleep deprivation. I've spent the greater part of my adult life being sleep deprived, so I feel like I'm an expert on the topic. I can speak from experience. <laughs> Lots of negative consequences, one of which is sometimes people who are sleep deprived aren't very easy to get along with. I'm told that that was the case for me for a lot of years. But in any case, um, what I wanted to talk about today was a new study showing that sleep deprivation actually in, uh, in influences our food choices and not for the better. So how this experiment was conducted, scientists used MRI to measure brain activity in 23 participants after they had a good night's sleep and then after they had a sleepless night. And the researchers observed changes in the frontal lobe, which governs complex decision making, like am I gonna do the right thing, the wrong thing, and also changes in the reward centers of the brain that govern things like eating. And uh, so what they showed was that decision-making capacity was impaired while more primal regions of the brain that deal with seeking pleasure and reward were enhanced. Now to show how it in fact affected food choices, the researchers measured brain activity as the subjects were shown 80 food images that ranged from really healthy choices like fruit and vegetables to horrible things like donuts and pizza. The participants were given the food they craved most at the end of the MRI scans. On the days when the people were sleep deprived, potato chips and junk foods ruled the day in terms of food choices. They stimulated much stronger responses in the part of the brain that governs motivation to eat. The sleepier the subjects described themselves as being, the worse their, cho their choices were, the more desserts and junk food they wanted. In fact, food choices made in response to fatigue equaled 600 calories more than the food choices that were made when the subjects were well rested. Now, to make sure that there was no difference in hunger levels, on the nights when the participants were deprived of sleep, they were given apples and peanut butter crackers, so there really wasn't a difference in hunger. And sometimes people explain the increased desire for junk foods after being sleepless is, oh, well, you know, people aren't sleeping, so they have increased activity levels, which means they need more food. That wasn't the case here. So um, it is well documented that people who are sleep deprived, shift workers, tend to be more overweight and more likely to become obese than people um, who get a good night's rest. And of course, there's more to it than just the sleep deprivation. And with a lot of health issues, it's just one more little piece of it. But um, you do have to watch your decision making. And I thought about this a lot as I was writing this article, that uh, some of my worst food choices have been made when I'm sleep deprived. And of course, mine don't, I don't eat animal foods under any circumstances, but uh, I sure can pack in the sugar if I'm sleep deprived and there's any around. So watch yourself when you're a little more tired, more likely to make bad choices. So the other thing I want to talk about is a <laughs> new study, the HPV vaccine, which keeps coming up and I still get emails about it every week. And I guess I'll just start by saying I think we can add the Centers for Disease Control to the list of federal agencies who've decided that they work more for the drug companies than they do in the interest of public health. And Dr. Campbell wrote about this in whole. I mean, he, he really had a lot of things to say. I don't think he couches words with any federal agencies in that book, but uh, one of the CDC's most important projects I've noticed for a long time seems to be promoting vaccines and then making sure the vaccine makers are protected against liability for their actions. And in keeping with their mission, the CDC recently decided to analyze data on the efficacy of the HPV vaccine and in spite of the fact that the study showed that it was virtually useless, what they reported was, quote, the estimated vaccine effectiveness was high. 
now they couch it with terms like estimated and the article acknowledged that the vaccination rate in the population that was studied was low, which does in fact skew the results. But nonetheless, the press release was just glowing. It said, there was, it actually sent out a press release with the title, new study shows HPV vaccine helps lower HPV infection rates in teen girls. That was the exact uh, headline. But here's the straight story, and I actually didn't have to do a whole lot of research on this because a dietitian posted this on her blog. Her name is Charlene Bedini. She's obviously um, a little anti this vaccine also. The study included 8,000 women, but they spanned a real large age range on up to 59 years old, and only 740 of them, less than 10%, were actually teenage girls. So it's interesting that they focused on teen girls in the news release. Of the 740 teens, only 382 were sexually active, which means the other 358 had absolutely zero risk for any type of infection, and so should have been excluded from the study. But it gets even better. Among the 382 sexually active teens, only 111 got at least one dose of the vaccine. Now, millions and millions of girls have been vaccinated with this vaccine over the years, and they can only find 382 and 111 who've actually had even a single dose. I mean, this isn't a study. This is, I don't even know what to call this. Um, but anyway, the misreporting gets even worse. During the study period, the incidence of HPV infection uh, dropped by under 6% in the vaccinated teens, but 27% was the drop in teens who weren't vaccinated. So. The fact that this study reported anything at all is ridiculous, and that it reported anything pertaining to teens it just stretches the imagination. But if I had looked at it, here would have been my headline, HPV vaccine not effective, teens who don't receive the shots are better off. But we can always count on the CDC to spin the information in favor of the drug companies, always at every opportunity. So I'll continue to tell teens and their parents, when you're in a doctor's office and the HPV vaccine is offered, learn to just say no. The most important words you can learn if you're gonna interact with the medical community, just say no. All right, that's all for today. Have a wonderful day and I'll be back to you on Thursday as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it.